Okay, so we're going to start recording. Great. Elizabeth Metzger is the author of Bed, Tupelo Press 2021, winner of the Sunken Garden Chapbook Prize, The Spirit Papers from University of Massachusetts Press in 2017, which is the winner of the Jupiter Prize for Poetry, and the chapbook, The Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death by Horse Thief Books in 2017. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Poetry Magazine, American Poetry Review, The Nation, the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day. Her prose has appeared in Conjunctions, Literary Hub, Guernica, and Boston Review. She is a poetry editor at the Los Angeles Review of Books. Of Bed, the contest judge, Mark Bibbins writes, Elizabeth Metzger's poems act as both repositories and engines of mystery, of secrets other secrets have rubbed away. Yet their mysteriousness never feels coy. There's a difference between hiding information and asserting control over how it's revealed. Quote, I stayed off center, she writes, and to me, this has always seemed like one of the better places from which to view things. But hers is furthermore a poetry that recognizes, as Gertrude Stein put it, there is no use in a center. Among Metzger's many gifts is her ability to describe complicated positions simply, facing down the conundrums of language and perspective to devastating effect. Quote, the children left me, you say they came. Please help me welcome Elizabeth Metzger. Jenny, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, I am just in awe to be reading tonight with two of my favorite poets, Lamar Wilson and Kave. Um, it is truly an honor. I feel like it's equally um, fateful and shocking to be here in this Hudson Valley community because um, Jenny, of course, was, was instrumental to the work of the poet Max Ritbo, who brought many of us here together. Um, and Max and I wrote our first books together. We had a deep friendship and I will never forget, um, though I couldn't be there at the Hudson Valley uh, Writers' Center when he read that, it, luckily it was recorded and the vibrant energy of his voice in that room is forever connected to this space. Um, so thank you for inviting me. And I want to begin by bringing him, his words, if not his voice into the room. Um, this is a poem from his posthumous collection the final voicemails, which was edited by our Nobel laureate, Louise Glick. The title is cachexia, which is um, a wasting away or loss of muscle and weight that can occur at the end stages of some chronic illnesses. Cachexia. Today, I woke up in my body and wasn't that body anymore. It's more like my dog, for the most part, obedient warming to me when I slip it goldfish or toast, but it sheds, can't get past a simple sit, stay, turn over, house trained, but not entirely. This doesn't mean it's time to say goodbye. I've realized the estrangement is temporary and for my own good. My body's work to break the world into bricks and sticks has turned inward. As all the doors in the world grow heavy, a big white bed is being put up in my heart. No matter how sad Max's poems can be, that was one from the, the end of his life when, when Jenny was helping so much to give him, give him so much reason to believe in his, the legacy of his work. Um, he wrote some very sad poems like that one, and yet there's always this tenderness at the end, that bed. And I think that I want to use that as my segue to read from my chapbook, Bed. Um, which was written from an experience of actually two different bed rest pregnancies, the first one dovetailing with the loss of Max, you know, within weeks. I, so I told him I was pregnant and two weeks later, he was dead and I was in bed. I was very strange. Um, and so I will read some poems from that sequence. I will start with the first one. 
I think of bed of the bed as sort of a, a lived calendar. Um, we you know often begin and end our day in a bed. We often begin and are born and die in a bed. Um, so when you're constantly in a bed for whatever reason, it changes your relationship to time. It changed. It intensified my perspective to change. Um, so I'm going to start with the first poem, which was the first poem I wrote after giving birth. And it was a big, a beginning of sorts because, of course, it was a birth. But it also, especially, you know, between Max and just what the pregnancy was for me, it was very much an ending of part of myself. One exit. In one or two lives, I opened the door with the prize, only to find the prize was not worth the life. I wanted the door. Brave mahogany door, you be my fortune. Teach me to understand the cry in your grain, the suffering circles by which your tree wisdom is known. I was superior with handles, gentle with thresholds, then this. Choices at morning hours, I usually skip but there is a little cash flow of beauty where there is almost no more water. And there is not room and light enough to stand behind the second and listen anymore. I am going through the language of me now. I am flipping open the dictionary of myself with my tongue as if that were possible to find your first word. In the torture of a foyer, doorless for entering, I am entering none. One, um, I, I couldn't do a lot of things while on bed rest, but one thing I could do was think a lot and reflect on, on childhood. And I think because the odds I was given uh, were 50-50 for a prolonged amount of time about whether the, the pregnancy would work out. And I very much wanted it, especially with the raised stakes of, of just loss around me. Um, I, I did, I couldn't really think about the role of being a mother, but I was very much able to go back and think about how I became a self at all or who I am at all. Um, so this is a sort of origin myth. Exaggerated honey. Once there was nobody left to love, a family had me. My mother made a steeple with her hands that folded open to reveal no people. Show me again, I said. Tell me again not to talk to strangers. The hospital lights across the street taught me to stay awake in my own company. Later, I asked strangers to take my hand across. I used to think I hated where I came from and would leave, that children elsewhere found safety and freedom. But there is no fire anywhere I am capable of rubbing. I am not mother enough to tolerate creating my own heat, not human enough to gather close to what's untouchable. Call me complaint. Call me Honey, you exaggerate. When my family laughs in the hallway, I laugh with my hair thrown back to the ground like I understand them. Just to be answered, I take it as seriously as the dead or a bridge to nowhere. But what loss on earth would I honestly like to stay for? And life is no better, thank God. It also keeps us. The next poem also returns to um, childhood in the sense that I was imagine because the present, which I think now we maybe have all experienced in these past few years, some version of isolation, the present can feel a sort of limbo. And when that happens, sometimes the past and the future can feel closer together. So I imagined this space of the playground, which is a place you don't really go to unless you are a child or with a child. And it became an imaginary space where I could bring together my child self and this future child, both equally sort of unreal. You've been on earth so long already. All my life, all I've wanted was to be myself and someone else, not theirs, but them. My shame about this greed made me hesitant with other children. I wanted what they wanted, but apart. I tried to make it, spooned what I could in shallow mental dishes I stacked all night and poured through my neediest hole, which opens only for medicine or extreme misunderstanding. My teeth browned from too much thirst too late. My eyes bulged from noticing what I wasn't meant to be. There was a playground which I went to and can't take you. The first thing I did daily was look for a place to hide or flee. There were plenty of gates and wide enough trees, but I stayed off center, just beyond the sprinkler's way. The other children played until they snacked around me. 
Sometimes they cried. Sometimes they looked consoled by what they couldn't have. No, not now. The boundary of things. The boundary of time. I wish this for you. Come soon to be withheld. They were so freely asking for more world. I'm going to read um, a sort of spiritual reckoning poem that um, speaks to my experience too during this time. I, I don't really identify as a believer or a non-believer. I have trouble answering that question, but I did find that with the uncertainty and the desperation, I was very much looking for signs and found myself praying a lot, um, whether it was a bubble in an IV or a slant of light through the room window. Um, things seem to have significance. And I sort of laughed at this in the same way that I do when I find myself praying in turbulence and otherwise not. Um, but then I, in, in writing this, I think I've forgiven myself or discovered that that root of faith in the desperation and the uncertainty is probably in some sense universal, whether there is a God or not. Um, so this is about that, that instinct to believe rather than God itself, the God incentive. He kept me through childhood. There was a reason he kept me from sin, like a biscuit warming in the oven. It's okay, I tell the rain, to keep him a theory, but bring him down once in a while. It's okay to be honest or selfish, but find the spot where you sink a little into the velvet stadium seat of secrets other secrets have rubbed away. See, I've been alone and didn't know it, waiting on the inside glass of a trafficked world where one mistrust passes another with a long yellow horn that no hand can quiet. Something other than science is pressing down on my night watch, saying, sing here instead of signing off this hour. Ride the hard part, that is the good part, as many holy animals must know and let go of. Everyone is still barely alive. I wanna read an elegy. Um, for the poet, our teacher, uh, Lucy Brock Broido. And I say our teacher because I'm pretty sure she taught Jenny. And um, she, yeah, she, she also brought Max and me together. She was the head of poetry at Columbia for a very long time. And um, she was also my, more than a poetry teacher to me, she was sort of a grief guardian. Um, she helped me, she held my hand um, through Max dying and after. So when she herself died less than two years later, it, it did seem um, impossible. And this poem's title comes from a aphorism of Kafka, a poet that, I mean, a writer that Max and um, Lucy and probably many of us uh, sort of worship. And the, uh, the aphorism is about what heaven is, it says the maybe heaven is the impossibility of crows. So this poem is titled The Impossibility of Crows. Your death has just begun, but it is not spoken of. It speaks in odd weathers, like a second first love, as if the snow could fall for real here, as if you would deign to visit me through sun. There are no directions. The edges of your death are smudged and round, like ash or a watch whose accuracy is the least of its beauty. There is no clear ill will. There is no bronzy heaven. You will come to me instead, though I never came to you, won't you? It's not too late yet. It isn't blood or sex. It isn't even the spirit or splinted ambition. Today, I will stay for just the last unafraid, adoring avalanche of you, as if my life had wound itself up and let go with yours, a made metal crow, acting born, choosing its crack time, then tiptoeing off your branch of the world. Shortly after Lucy died, I was pregnant again and it was you know not supposed to be by all medical ideas it was not meant to be repeated but yet i was on bed rest again with another high risk pregnancy so instead of holding on to this discrete experience these grief very significant losses and these two pregnancies sort of blurred together too and i think um that's something i'm trying to capture as much as any of the actual experiences the last poem i'm going to read from bed is a love poem and then i'm going to read two uh, new ones if i have time this one is a, a postpartum love poem, I would say. It's with the acknowledgement of coming back to romantic love, um, having had two, two real children between us. Desire, it is for you I put the children to bed, or come, 
I will keep the house awake for you. The floor is fluttering with tongues. I step through and you step after me laughing. These are toys. Isn't it obvious how we've changed? I have no more use for pure feeling. You escape directly behind my head. Little vitrines in the closed museums not being looked at. I would die to be their objects. The children left me. You say they came. What could you possibly do for my body when I am in two separate rooms, breathing? And so these next two poems, um, well, the first one comes from sort of playing with the idea of, of moving on, um, which is not something that I fully believe in. I don't think grief really ever works that way. So um, I, it's called moving out and it sort of plays against that. And I wanted to read it tonight because I wanna bring Max in again, even though of course it's never as um, substantial as, as his words. I wish there were new poems of his coming into the world, but there is an ongoing relationship I do have with him that feels beyond a voice in my head, or maybe it is a voice in my head and maybe that's enough. Um, but this, uh, it does make reference to a volcano vape. So what that is, is there's a specific vaporizer that Max used at the end for medical marijuana that was able to not hurt the lungs as much. And it really was a, a beautiful object in his room for, for us and for me because it, um, it just had the capacity even at the end to briefly at least take away pain. Moving out. Open this box alone for no reason other than to know you are alone now. No reason to keep talking about love. Open this box and inside expect the volcano vape the dead used to get high. Don't fill it with leaves, sit with it, useless. The dead, imagine, that's what you have to call him who convinced you that people were the reason to live, that you don't know the end. You filled yourself with a baby to leave him gently in his last weeks. Let the flaps close themselves. It is years you get to live, to decide a love you never had is ready. And I'll just end with this poem. Um, I hope it's a note of hope. Um, it's a poem that comes from a tweet and um, a tweet by a climate scientist, Dr. Beth Sowen, whose words really took me out of a dark phase. Um, and, and I wrote my way into her words and sort of around them. And um, I just think that, you know, all of us over these years have had so many different kinds of losses, great and small and disappointments and things we're not fulfilled by that we thought we should be. And those are the very things that we often think are, you know, hindrances to going on. And I think that um, in this poem, I, I sort of found that in shifting my perspective, I could see those very same things as the driving force to go on. So it's called stay. If only someone had told you your true extent, how you connect to mountain glaciers and tropical orchids, how this is your time for young children, excessive salt, lost sex, how hands you have never felt are waiting in pockets now, how you come from ancient fish and before that single cells that found advantages together. You learned to speak, didn't you? So you could choose instead to write it all down, how you needed so much help to carry the lives you made down. Now you can see through your own skin how your doubt glints sure as the glass divide in a taxi no one you know yet is riding. What you thought you would need forever would never have been enough. How you wouldn't have wanted to be satisfied anyway. How you spent hours filling bowls to be scraped. How you will find your own jaw lovely one day eating from them. How your daughter takes her first steps tonight as soon as you lay her down in her crib her own joy, you can't trespass, but the freedom is yours to leave her. How you hoped to die believing you lived perpetually with trees, and when it rained, really stormed, in crisis you decided again and again whom you loved. How the ones who left earth already light up in the eyes of the ones here you stopped longing for. Even now, starlight animates everything about you. Go ahead, look at the strangers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was really, really beautiful. And thank you.
for reading Max's work tonight, as well as your own, and as well as the ones um, that are in conversation with Max's work. So much loss um, for people who loved Max and also for the Columbia community with Lucy and now with Richard Howard. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to be here tonight with, with all of you and to commemorate their work. Um, now we're going to hear from L. Lamar Wilson, who is a multi-genre writer and filmmaker invested in documentary poetics. He's the author of Sacrilegion, the 2012 selection for the Carolina Wren Press Poetry Series, a 2013 independent publishers group bronze medalist and the Tom Gunn Award finalist. And he's also co-author of Prime, Poetry and Conversation from Sibling Rivalry Press with Philip B. Williams, Ricky Laurentis, Saeed Jones, and Daryl Alejandro Holness. Other poems and essays have appeared in Poetry, The New York Times, Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, African American Review, Black Gay Genius, Bodies Built for Game, The Prairie Schooner Anthology of Contemporary Sports Writing, Callaloo, Crazy Horse, and many other journals and publications. He has received fellowships from Cave Canem, Ragdale, and Hurston Wright Foundations. He holds an MFA from Virginia Tech and a PhD in African American and multi ethnic American poetics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His recent work centers on the voices and experiences of Black and Brown folk thriving in the rural South, despite relentless centuries long homegrown terrorism. After nearly 18 years of award-winning editing in several of the nation's top newsrooms, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, Wilson now teaches creative writing, literature and film studies at Florida State University and in the low residency MFA program at Mississippi University for William for Women. Of Sac Religion, A. Van Jordan writes, L. Lamar Wilson reinvents the memoir in verse with the tour de force of his sacrilegion, with a keen eye that toggles between reverie and our hopes for the future. He offers a salve for any soul that knows what it feels like to be counted out, only to fight back toward resurrection. Few collections will move the spirit like this one. From, from its incantatory moments to those that speak in tongues, you believe with every line that this poet does, quote, feel everything everywhere else more than most. And tonight we're also gonna hear new work from him. Please help me welcome El Lamar Wilson. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, you know, I, we didn't plan this, but um, Elizabeth, I, um, uh, April 1st would have been Gil Scott Heron's uh, birthday. And he has been, um, as a somebody who lost his life to the AIDS epidemic, who fought back from addiction, and who, you know, um, loved America enough to critique it. I've been reading his work intently. But I wanted to share a poem of his that sort of opened up something in me in the midst of the pandemic that I don't think he's quite known for. So I would, I'm gonna invite Gil Scott Heron into the room. Um, this is a poem of his called, A Very Precious Time. Was there a touch of spring? Did she have a pink dress on? And when she smiled, her shyest smile, could you almost touch the warmth? And was it your very first love, a very precious time? Was there the faintest breeze? And did she have a ponytail? And could she make you feel 10 feet tall walking down the grassy trail? Was it your first love, a very precious time, time? Now they got me trying to define in later life what her love means to me. And it keeps me struggling to remember my first touch of spring. Was there a touch of spring in the air? And did she have a pink dress on? 
And when she smiled, her shyest smile, could you almost touch the warmth? Was it your first love? A very precious, very precious, very precious time, time. Of course he sang that, but I wanted to read the words because I just think uh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful uh, poem and song. So I'm from a, a little town called Mariana, Florida, um, and, and Sacrilegion was born out of, um, you know, a time when I was very far metaphysically and physically away from it, um, thinking I would never return. And so I'm reading you from this book, from this space that made me, which is quite remarkable. So I want to start here. Times like these, Mariana. Twelve. In one field, husks, muscadine vines, and a sugar cane graveyard, furrow acres aching for the devil to beat his wife, which is actually happening right now. In another, a skein of maggots and mayflies, musk thick and resolute, jockey for the cows after birth. Down Old U.S. Road, Weevils wheeze and chafe bells of hay settle for the wind's sneezes. Wait for a sign, the couple says, and set their table with damask, fresh pressed for a feast of sardines and cornbread. Train their child in the way he should babble. From dusk till dusk, they lull the boy with tales of a faraway sea. Buckets of oysters to shuck. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Still, no rain. From dusk till dusk, they till dust. And they reach for the locks of hair and black eyed peas, stowed away for times like these. I spent my undergraduate years in, a, um, in Tallahassee, Florida, where I now teach, and I thought, in the second section of this book, um, I was trying to gather this moment where I felt undone. Um, as Jenny said, I spent you know, a long time as a journalist, and this was at the very beginning of my journalism career uh, as, a, as a student in Tallahassee. So this is lost and found in Tallahassee. I was also trying to honor the indigenous histories there. Eros uno de los nosotros the old women chant as they circle me at the center table. Their molasses hands smooth my pimply cheeks. You are one of us, they sing, the beat of their pattering feet in sync with my quaking knees. They have journeyed from Nacimiento to thank students who have decided to civilize them. Eres un mascoco, says one who looks like my grandmother's sister. You are black Seminole. She traces the scars on the hand that will not move, that I try to hide, speaks of a home that I knew, never knew I knew. What to say? Soy un americano negro, I mumble. Esto es nuestro hogar también, she hums. This is not your home, too. This is not the story I have memorized. I am a reporter here to capture a tale of new sewer lines and street lights that will make her blue black face shine. Que se, que se les gustaría decir a los estudiantes? I probe again. I need a sound bite, a groveling that fits the news I must print. I do not tell her she is mocked across this city's tracks with a hey ya ho and fake war paint. I do not have to. My pen is running out of ink. My rehearsed accent fails. Her eyes wrinkle into smiles. Eres uno de nosotros. Eres uno de nosotros. Eres uno. It's funny because, you know, I was talking about those tracks and now I'm, I'm there all the time. So it's kind of ironic. I want to read just two more poems, of, um, kind of Florida born poems. Um, one honors um, a woman who, um, you know, this week we marked the assassination of a Dr. King. If we're living right, we don't want to forget that, you know, um, that happened. Um, we like to remember that I have a dream, but we don't, we don't want to 
to tell the whole story sometimes or deal with the, the reality of the whole story. But I, I, I choose this poem and I wrote this poem because I, I wanted to think about a woman who survived into her 90s. Um, this book, uh, Sacrilegion, deals a lot with uh, insanity and mental illness and um, dis-ease that comes from being misunderstood. And so I chose her um, at the time when I wrote this, I didn't know she was still alive. I was trying to find her. Um, I had been searching the New York City um, uh, prison records to try to find where she was. We would later learn that she had been released from prison in the 70s and put in an old folk home where she continued to, I would say, to pretend. Or, or she continued to live with, be ravaged by um, her illnesses. Um, and so this is Isola Ware Curry's Picky. And this is taken from the arrest report. Uh, she attempted to kill Dr. King in the 1950s. And if she had succeeded, we would not have had the movement, the March on Washington and anything. Picky. In the end, Tarzan always get hold of Jane. And what I'm trying to figure is how he swing on them vines and know which one of them gals to can hold him fast and not take him out on the wrong limb. How he lands so soft like, not a speck of flesh, sweat on his flesh, like them peaches where I come from. You got to be careful which one you bite into, even if it look like it's sweet as cane, could be a worm or worse inside. Grinning at you like you the unexpected guest. So when I went to the picture show to get out the house and stop by the store to hunt for some work or a smile or two. And I saw this mob, this boy and his mob calling him a, a Kang, Arthur Lucifer, I think, which sound like Lucifer to me. And when I got up close enough to look him in his eyes, he looked at me like I was common. Cause all the rest of them he got a hold of, like he sure didn't seem to know too much about where I been and Talk about a freedom he knew I ain't never gonna see. So right then I knew it was him or me gonna take a stab at living another day. And just this one time, I chose me. She stabbed him in the heart with a, well in the chest with a letter opener. I had a gun in her pocket prepared to shoot him and they pulled her off him. And um, I just was amazed that she was so ravaged that she called him Arthur Lucer. Like that's it stuck with me, um, and she was born like 30 minutes from where Coretta Scott King was born and raised. So it was just, it was just something that still haunts me that she lived into her 90s and we lost him so young. Um, one more poem from Sacrilegion, and then some new poems, a couple new poems. Um, this is the penultimate poem in the in the manuscript, um, and it's also about Florida and um, the. <sighs> presciently the, what, how it would play in the future of America's election system. Substantia Nigra. I pay a man to touch me now. In halogen he comes to give what no other has. He bows at my bidding. He knows where the burning leads. Back to that thatch box, Florida. One Saturday morn, not unlike the one that breached me into song to prayer without surcease, soundtracked by that substantia nigra, that alluvial wealth whose terror deepens with time, welled in a phallic home of too many branches of water and not enough swamps, home of broken Spanish moss, broken ballot boxes submerged in swamps and locked in church halls, licensed to shoot anything you fear or hate or fathom you own if you're light enough. It's the law in this no man's land, licked dry by an unhinged ex-lover. Some call him son, I call him enemy now. Now I like it dark. I ran across the border to Clay, said, here, take and eat. Damned God for a bald, shiny head, repent, repeat. Said, he'll do till you come home. Said, he hawks black art. I won't be a hard sell. Just need a devotional om for my objectification. He'll sit through my musings, then surprise me with his intellect, punctuating my sentences with his lisp. 
I'll savor, he'll savor my run on monologues. His gentle tongue will glide over my fears. I'll swallow his sincerity, I'll pass it on. He touched me and made me knew that Saturday morn I could not wait for you. I pay this soothsayer now to quiet my Cerberus, anoint my fearsome heads with oil. I moan to silence his star and snarls, hum him to sleep. Ah, this grayscale world, intractable, Tartarus for perpetuity. Oh, Florida, oh, Panhandle, you penal colony, you haven of anonymous alms and arms, welcomed in pitch, home of the men who made me wish for the womb that made me and the ones who made me wish I had one had the heft to bear the weight of this needling head, this water breaking, this grazing with the ones who gaze east daily for the first, the man who will never be the only one whose pining primes our quest. I pay my medicine man, that doubting Thomas, that one with archangel name and face to limb what keeps us alive and weld, but not spilling, not black or white or blue enough. These wise men say, I must tell you here and again, here again and always, I'm sick. I'm saved by their hands. Otherwise, other men will lock me in a steel box. A man, a white one, did once. Twas dark in there. I escaped doing what he forbade. Screamed, I am a man, I am. I refuse his bitter pills still. O oh, Dr. Jesus, part this endless sea of doctors, of men's sin-sick vision of these scars. O oh, mirror of my mind, here, now, and forevermore, I am not pocked. These marks, not beast stings. These broken bones are broken bones. Do not portend or pretend. Black men, not mannish among black men, know how to be solvent. Sh sister, sugar, mama, chula, Rahab, saint, ring the taint out. Where to tuck the bleach, how to cover blotches, slice edges, cinch waist into translucent bags. I left mine on mama and daddy's front porch. The dust mites won't touch it. The might bees can't. Ah, I blied. I never left you, Mariana. I am that boy, that man in this mirror, more than enough to touch what no man can. I am that woe man too. I ring an other, and halogen he comes. We sing Negro spirituals. It's a black woe man thing. I told Jesus, be all right if he changed my name. Too many deaths, too infinitesimal to many, though I'll never stop counting. Tonight I take this ringed man. He leaves me wanting you, wanting me. Who knows the way to Canaan? Got my ticket in my hand. I ain't got time to die. So um, with the four or five minutes I have, I took two really short pieces um, uh, from uh, uh, this new manuscript um, that is uh, about, as Jenny said, these people who are um, in this town that I grew up from, who, the, who are like, um, who, who passed on, we've lost in the midst of this pandemic, so many of them. And so as they died, I started to write some of these poems uh, for them. Um, I want to read first, though, something that's sort of like the first poem that I wrote after um, I figured out what I wanted to do with this book, which is a continuation of um, what you just heard. This is called Queer, and it uses a, a word that was given to us by e, the scholar E. Patrick Johnson um, years ago. Queer. A man is a woman inside, waiting to come home. A man inside a woman is a mother of pearl, a waiting handmaiden inside a man made prison, prism of light. At the end of that eternal new birth, 
new birth. Tunnel to that end, light the prism, prison break every man's woe. Inside, every man lies the seed of mother's tears, petaled, pearled, seven weeks whole, wonderfully she made us beauty inside us and us and us against sin us greater than sin us greater than skin us skin and sinless and iridescent all spirit no shade no shame liminal limb it all one nation undone less than god less now what O oh, ama may i i inside the we we was decode the cipher we've forgotten to whom it may concern keep this nigger boy running O oh, woe man come woman hater O oh, nakre O oh, negus never nigger cry out and she will rise inside us. She's waiting, black woe man, stop running, come home. So I did, I came home. And in this space, there's such beauty because um, this space is a rare place where many of the people who were enslaved um, and went through the horrors of reconstruction, like my families, um, were able to get some land and have stayed. And so whereas people escaped during the middle, I mean, during the, um, the, the great migration of the early 20th century, um, many of, of my ancestors are here and lived and died here and lived through the horrors of Jim Crow um, and, and made a space for me to be here um, now. So the last poem I will read um, is a poem um, that's in the voice of um, a woman who we kind of knew as the faith healer um, in our community. Um, her name was Carrie Bell. And um, doesn't that just sound like somebody who, who knows everything that, you, that we need to know? Um, uh, and she was, a, she was just a, she was a hoot. <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, she dipped snuff and she would curse you out and pray for you at the same, in the same breath. <laughs> um, and um, she didn't have children of her own, but all of us in the community were her children. Um, and I just adored her. And um, she would tell me stuff. Um, I don't know, they know, they know the writers in, in the community, I think. They know the people who can tell the stories. And she also you know, knew that she um, had not always been pure and holy. So the last poem, I thank you for your time, is Burden Hill Apothecary and Babalu Ali prepare stinging nettle tea. And Babalu Ayi is the god of death and the Yoruba tradition. And the Yoruba tradition is a big part of this manuscript. Burden Hill Apothecary and Babalu Ayi prepare stinging nettle tea. We don't die. We fruitful and multiply like the good master say. Fields of okra, snap peas, collards, cabbage spring out the ground. So many bullets sagging on the vine. You can hear them holler, pull me. Cut me, watch me grant. We oblige so much green between our waist and toes. We can't see the clay caked in the spurs cutting our heels for the pines that shade us. We tramp them cones they shed that see the soil that it keeps us alive. Our loins spilling, more miles begging to be filled every day. Them pecka woods would turn every limb into a grave if I make or let them. You talk about how they strung up claw, but you don't forgot that high yellow sought cellus. Smash his skull twain under the mac that magnolia over yonder where he sees in these here roots. Our boy to break this that fever you so afraid won't lose you, but every season more squash, kale, peanuts, melon split open, so sweet, so sweet. Everybody begged to sink their teeth in deep like them weeds we yank from this here earth. We won't die. We your worst nightmare. Shoot one of us down and our children's children seeds to take root and shoot up right here like our pappy's pappy's done. Mustards, 
limes, sweet potatoes, whites too, our roots too deep, you can't kill us all. Think of all that cane you so keen to suck on, drag that stalk too long, that juice will turn bitter as the laughter in your throat and choke. Don't let them fool you into cutting your tongues out your own mouths. This, these here is the best of times where the sun don't stop shining till you can smell the moonshine midnight riders crawling out their bed to climb in yours and rub against you till you sang like locusts in heat. A low hum, a steady moan, till they kingdom come and morning light appear. Thanks. Thank you so much, Elamar. That was really beautiful. So glad to have you with us tonight um, and that you brought up one of your dearly beloved um, writers who you've lost. And that goes really well with what we're doing here today, celebrating Max Ritvo and, and his life and work. Um, I think that it was probably on Dive Dapper that I first read Max's um, quote about what it's important, what, what is important to do and how to have a, a good life. And he said, spend your life cultivating relationships with people who are substantive and who are able to step outside of themselves, who prioritize compassion and love in a deep sense and seek out intimacy, seek out people who are trying very hard to love the best they can. Um, we've all learned so much from Max and continue to learn from his, from his poems. So it's nice to see so many people here who were at the reading at the Hudson Valley Writers Center and who loved him so much. Um, his mom is here and um, of course, Elizabeth. So we're very happy to introduce our, our last poet of the evening. Kava Akbar is the author of Calling a Wolf a Wolf, Portrait of the Alcoholic, and most recently, Pilgrim Bell from Grey Wolf Press. He is also the editor of the Penguin Book of Spiritual Verse, 100 Poets on the Divine. He is the recipient of the Lucille Medwick Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, several Pushcart Prizes, and the Larry Levis Reading Award. He is the founder of the poetry interview website, Dive Dapper. He currently teaches at Purdue University and in the low residency MFA program at Randolph College and Warren Wilson College. And he is the poetry editor for The Nation. Of his work, The New Yorker says, Akbar is exquisitely sensitive to how language can function as both presence and absence. His practice of taking language apart and harnessing the empty space around it makes even the most familiar words seem eerie and unexpected. And you'll see exactly what the New Yorker means by that tonight when he reads his work. Please help me welcome Keva Akbar. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me and everyone at the, um, at the Writer Center. And thank you, Lamar and Elizabeth. Um, I'm, such a, I'm such an ardent fan of both of yours on the page on and off. Um, and yeah, you dignify and distinguish my work by letting me read with you. So thank you for that. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I know that everyone in the world is tired of being on Zoom at this point. And so thanks for kicking it with us for um, a little bit of time on a Wednesday night. I was about to say on a Thursday night. Um, on a Wednesday night, um, I'm just, I'm just gonna read some poems. Um, uh, this first poem, I'm, I'm also, I should say, I'm also fasting right now. And so I feel like my brain is like moving like a beat slower than um, I'm like a beat behind in every conversation that I have still, um, which is which is good. But when you're um, performing or when you're sharing space 
like this, it can be a little bit frustrating. Um, yeah, but I'm just gonna start reading poems. And because um, transcendent American poet Max Ritvo has been brought into the room among other um, really, really powerful um, individuals and friends and beloveds, um, I'd like to spend some time with, uh, I'd like to spend some more time with Max as well. The last time I read at the actual train station was with Sarah Rule and we were, um, we were celebrating Max as well, um, which is a thing that I love to do and I love. So I'm gonna read a, I'm gonna read a, a Max poem that I like a lot um, called The End. Um, uh, and this is also from his second full length collection, Four Reincarnations. This is called The End. The moon was dark, like it had taken too many pills to produce light. I'm just gonna, like it had taken too, the moon was dark, like it had taken too many pills to produce light, to like open a poem. It's just like, you know, my kingdom for like that first line, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the moon was dark, sorry, okay, I, I apologize. Um, this is called The End by Max Ritvo. The moon was dark, like it had taken too many pills to produce light. The earth fell apart into pockets, the many things in it, noticing where they were and surfacing. Heaven was a vacuum, the earth a dirty carpet. What is there to say? All the animals went blind, the pigs out in the countryside and my dear dog who used to fetch. I wondered at one point if I had in fact killed myself if death just meant spending all your time with your past. The more there is, the more loss there is. True not only of the world, but of perceiving it, even of the imagination sizzling on top of it. I love him so much, he's such a weirdo. Um, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, again, that was a non-me poem. That was a Max Ritfeld poem. I'm gonna read. Um, uh, some me poems and I'll probably read some more non me, -me poems too. Um, uh, this poem um, is called The Miracle. Uh, this is a me poem. Um, it's called The Miracle. Um, it orbits in Islam, the sort of like precipitating miracle of the faith, um, maybe parallel to the virgin birth in Christianity is that the prophet was at the start of Ramadan. Um, uh, was said to be sort of alone and fasting in a cave. You know, he was just camping, camping. We camp, we're familiar with camping. Um, he was camping and, uh, and the angel Gabriel comes to him and says, read. And like many people in his time and place in the world, like most people, most times and places in the world, he was illiterate. And, um, and so he said, sorry, you know, wish I could help you. Uh, and the angel Gabriel like grabs him and gives him literacy. And then he begins to transcribe to him the Quran. And, and that's again, like the sort of catalytic miracle of the faith is literacy, which I always thought was pretty cool um, as a poet. So anyways, this is orbiting that. This is called the miracle. Gabriel seizing the illiterate man alone and fasting in a cave and commanding Read, the man saying, I can't. Gabriel squeezing him tighter, commanding, read. The man gasping, I don't know how. Gabriel squeezing him so tight he couldn't breathe, squeezing out the air of protest, the air of doubt, crushing it out of his crushable human body, saying, read in the name of your Lord who created you from a clot, and thus literacy revelation. It wasn't until Gabriel squeezed away what was empty in him that the prophet could be filled with miracle. Imagine the emptiness in you, the vast cavities you have spent your life trying to fill with fathers, mothers, lovers, language, drugs, money, art, praise, and imagine them gone. What's left? whatever you aren't, which is what makes you a house useful, not because it's floorboards or ceilings or walls, but because the empty space between them. Gabriel isn't coming for you. 
If he did, would you call him Jibril or Gabriel like you are here? Who is this even for? One crisis at a time. Gabriel isn't coming for you. Cheese on a cracker, a bit of salty fish. Somewhere a man is steering a robotic plane into murder. Robot from the Czech robata, meaning forced labor. Murder labor, forced. He never sees the bodies which are implied by their absence, like feathers on a paper bird. Gabriel isn't coming for you. In the absence of cloud parting, trumpet blaring clarity, what? More living, more money, lazy sex, mother, brother, lover. You travel and bring back silk scarves, a bag of chocolates for you don't know who yet. Someone will want them. Deliver them to an empty field. You fall asleep facing the freckle on your wrist. Somewhere a woman presses a button that locks metal doors with people behind them. The locks are useful to her because there is an emptiness on the other side that holds the people's lives in place. She doesn't know the names of the people. Anonymity is an ancillary feature of the locks. Ancillary from the Latin enquila, meaning servant, an emptiness to hold all their living. You created from a clot. Gabriel isn't coming for you. You too full to eat. You too locked to door, too cruel to wonder. Gabriel isn't coming. You too loved to love, to speak, to hear, too wet, to drink. No, Gabriel, you too pride to weep. You too play to still. You too high to come. No, Gabriel. Gabriel won't be coming for you, too fear to move, you too pebble to stone, too saddle to horse, too crime to pay. Gabriel, no, not anymore. You too gone to save, too bloodless to martyr, too diamond to charcoal, too nation to earth, you brute, cruel pebble. Gabriel, God of man, no, cheese on a cracker, mercy, mercy. Um, <clears throat> in this book, I have six poems called Pilgrim Bell. The book is called Pilgrim Bell. Um, and I have six poems called Pilgrim Bell, which is a thing people do. Um, <laughs> uh, Terrence Hayes did it in Wind in a Box. It might be the first time I ever saw it, but between then and this, there have been like 30,000 books that did it. So it's not a particularly innovative but anyways uh i um uh i don't know this poem is called pilgrim bell i don't i don't need to um i don't need to diminish it before i share it this poem is called pilgrim bell my savior has powers and he needs to be convinced to use them up until now, he has been a no-call, no-show, curious menace, like a hornet's nest buzzing on a plane wing, savior, younger than I pretend to be. Almost everyone is younger than I pretend to be. I am a threat, even in my joy, like a cat who playing kills, a mouse and tongues it back to life. The cat lives somewhere between wonder and shame. 
I live in a great mosque built on top of a flagpole. Whatever happens, happens loudly. All day I hammer the distance between earth and me into faith. Blue light pulls in through the long crack in my wall, braids into a net. The difference between a real voice and the other kind the way its air vibrates through you, the violence in your middle ear. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, thank you um, for saying nice things in the, I just saw that the, thank you for saying nice things. Um, Ari's here. Um, Hi, Ari. Um, I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read another poem. That's a that's a not me poem. Um, I've put together this anthology that's coming out in a few months called. Um, <laughs> it's had like thirty different titles, but I think the title that it is now is the Penguin Book of Spiritual Verse: One Hundred and Ten Poets on the Divine, um, and it's basically like a compendium of uh, forty three centuries of spiritual verse of just sort of like, this feels like made, like I made a playlist, you know? Um, but uh, but um, like a, you know, like a mixtape and I'm handing it to the beloved of the universe and being like, here's some poems I really love from the past like four odd millennia. Um, but, uh, but this is, um, uh, I've been spending a lot of time with this poet, and Hedwana, who's the earliest attributable author of our species, actually, she wrote in ancient Sumeria. Um, it, she lived sometime around 2300 BCE, and, um, and she's the first author ever that we like know the name of and can match the name to the writing, you know, um, Middle Eastern woman, not for nothing, but, um, but she, uh, but her poems, you know, up until this moment up until like this relative moment, you know, like the past few decades had only existed as sort of like anthropological trot, you know, like bird, woman, stone song, you know, like that sort of, you know, sound, you know, and um, and just in the past few decades, we've had poets translating from the, the anthropological sort of like raw denotative translations of the cuneiform into something like idiomatic English, you know? Um, and so this translation is one of her, she, all of her poems were hymns to the goddess Inanna. Um, you know, the, one of the, she was a priestess of Inanna. And, um, and this poem is one of her hymns to the goddess Inanna, um, translated by Jane Hirschfield, who's an incredible poet too, who I'm grateful to get to bring into the conversation. But again, um, I just, I've been spending so much time with Enhudwana specifically. Um, and I just, I wanted to share the gift that she gave us four millennia ago, because it still feels very, still feels very germane. I mean, I, I read her and I feel among the way that I feel like when I read Elizabeth or Lamar, you know, um, uh, I feel accompanied, you know, which is uncanny. Um, so again, this poem is not a me poem. This poem is by Enhidwana translated by Jane Hirschfield. Lady of all powers in whom light appears, radiant one, beloved of heaven and earth, tiara crown, priestess of the highest God, my lady, you are the guardian of all greatness. Your hand holds the seven powers. You lift the powers of being. You have hung them over your fingers. You have gathered the many powers. You have clasped them now like necklaces onto your breast. Like a dragon, you poisoned the land. When you roared at the earth in your thunder, nothing green could live. A flood fell from the mountain. 
You, Inanna, foremost in heaven and earth, lady riding a beast, you rained fire on the heads of men, taking your power from the highest, following the commands of the highest, lady of all the great rights, who can understand all that is yours? In the forefront of the battle, all is struck down by you, O oh, winged lady, like a bird you scavenge the land, like a charging storm, you charge. Like a roaring storm, you roar. You thunder in thunder, snort in rampaging winds. Your feet are continually restless, carrying your harp of sighs. You breathe out the music of mourning. It was in your service that I first entered the holy temple. I and Hedwana, the highest priestess, I carried the ritual basket. I chanted your praise. Now I have been cast out to the place of lepers. Day comes and the brightness is hidden around me. Shadows cover the light, drape it in sandstorms. My beautiful mouth knows only confusion. Even my sex is dust. Again, that's Jane Hirschfield's translation of um, uh, a hymn to Inanna by Anne Hedwana. It's, it's so uncanny, like she talks about like, <clears throat> in your fire, nothing green could live, right? And like, she's talking about, you know, as we teeter on the precipice of irreversible ecological collapse, right? She's talking about man's corrosive impact on the earth. And at some point between, I mean, this is nerdier than, you need, but um, at some point between her father, King Sargon's death and her brother's ascendance to the throne, she was exiled. And during that exile, she wrote a lot of these hymns, including this one. And so at the end of this poem, she was like, I was now I've been cast out to the place of lepers, right? And again, like, as we sit in a moment where the great sort of moral crisis of our century will be you know, refugee crises. And thus far, we've been getting straight Fs on that report card, you know, just failing them miserably. And as the climate crises exacerbate the refugee crises, you know, like, again, like, I go to this 43 century old poet, and she's talking to me about exile, you know, she's speaking from exile and about the, the pain of separation and the pain of being a refugee, you know, and it's just, it just feels like uncannily contemporary and Anyways, I, you know, I don't mean to be like blurbing a Sumerian priestess's <laughs> book, but, um, you know, she's, she's really incredible. And the Hirschfield translations um, really sing. Um, okay, I'm, I'll, uh, I'll wrap things up here um, so that uh, we can do a Q&A. Maybe I'll just read one more poem. Um, this, uh, I over, you know, everyone over um, quarantine was like, I'm gonna learn Mandarin or write King Lear or whatever, you know? And um, and my thing was to like, try to improve my Farsi. So I've been working with a Farsi tutor over um, the entirety of quarantine. Um, Farsi was my first language. I was born in Iran, but um, I've lived in America most of my life. So I'm not very good at Farsi. I'm a better reader of Farsi than I am a speaker of Farsi, but I'm not particularly good at either of them. Um, so, uh, and so over the quarantine, I've been reading this poet, Furuk Feroksad, who she was like probably the most important Iranian poet of the 20th century, for my money, the most important Iranian poet of the 20th century. Um, and so this is a poem that sort of orbits reading Feroksad. Um, it's called Reading Feroksad in a Pandemic Creatively. Uh, reading Feroksad in a Pandemic. The title is a lie. I can't read Farsi. I can make out. We lose. We lose. I type it into a translation app. We have lost everything we need to lose. In between what I read and what is written, need everything here the waving flag here the other world because we need mail people die 
because we need groceries, people die. I write, we need, knowing we dilutes my responsibility, like watercolors dipped in a fast river. Get behind me, English. When I text, to my dad, he writes back, we have lost whatever we had to lose. Hammering pentameter. Whatever we had. People die because they look like him. My uncle jailed, his daughter killed. This is a real fact, too wretched for letters. And yet, my uncle jailed, his daughter killed. Waving world, the other flag, there is room in the language for being without language. So much of wet is cold. So much of diamond is light. I want both my countries to be right, to fear me. We have lost whatever we had to lose. Thank you so much. Wow, what a reading tonight. I don't know whether it's um, the poetry or the antivirals that is helping me feel better from my COVID. Um, that was really great. I think that we won't start with our normal question, which is asking people to give advice to the poets who are doing a collection. I think that because there's been so much poetry here tonight that has been about grappling with grief and loss and, and how we as, as artists confront that um, and amplify that on the page, maybe we could hear from each of you a little bit about that project because you're all so good at it. So um, maybe we could just hear some, some words of advice. I don't mean to like leap into the fray, but I feel like maybe it's a nice thing for me to do that and not an obnoxious thing. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but one thing that I think a lot about, um, is the poet Heather Crystal wrote this book called The Crying Book, uh, which I don't know if people have, um, uh, but <clears throat> in it, she talks about how there are three different kinds of tears, um, like scientists have like looked at tears, you know, and, uh, and there are three different like distinct kinds. There are basal tears that just like lubricate your eyes all the time. There's like irritant tears that like wash stuff, you know, dust or whatever out of your eyes. And then there's um, psychogenic tears. And these are the tears that, you know, arise emotionally, right? Um, when you're very happy or very sad or whatever. And scientists have looked at all three of these kinds. I promise I'm making the point here. Um, uh, scientists have looked at all three of these kinds of tears under the microscope. <clears throat> and they found that, um, uh, the of those three kinds, the psychogenic tears have far denser protein structures than the other two kinds, which is to say that um, they're more viscous, they're, they're, they're denser, um, which again sounds silly until you realize that that viscosity means that they stay on your face, right? So like they, they psychogenic tears stay on your face, the other kinds just fall off. Um, why might that be evolutionarily advantageous? Well, you know, um, a parent could tell us pretty clearly, but this was like blowing my mind to think about, you know, like a crying is like a social behavior, right? It communicates like I am in distress, right? I am, I am pressed, I am in distress, you know, help me, right? And it communicates that directly to another human being at like the lizard brain level that lives underneath language, right? And so um, when I'm reading an old, you know, whatever Robert Hayden poem or a Yeats poem or whatever, um, that brings me to tears, right? That is 
that is a part of my lizard brain that is like, there's a member of my tribe in the room and I want to communicate to that. You know, I want to communicate to Mr. Hayden. I want to communicate to Ms. Dickinson, right? That like, that like I am in distress, you know, and that like she needs to come here and help me, right? Like I've never been, I'm getting goosebumps talking about this. I don't know if you can see that, but like I've never been the beneficiary of like a burning bush that, talk to me or like clouds part you know but like this is the magic that i have known right is like hearing a lamar palm that puts a beloved departed into the room with me right you know what i'm saying or like you know like revisiting our friend max's poem right and and like and like being back in the room with him right you know what i'm saying like um and and the way that like that is the magic that i have known you know you can you can call it whatever you want one, but like that's magic that is that is the magic that i have known and so um yeah that's what i can say that's so beautiful uh Kave, i love thinking about those the difference of those tears too um i think that sometimes i think of like the vowel sound in a lot of like greek tragedy or just like that sound that vowels are are sort of like the pre language language where it's just like the call of grief and just like when when language isn't sufficient and I feel like I get that way in life easily and frequently and um in a way it's it's helpful as a segue into into writing because once you have you're just reduced to that sort of root sound you can and you, you want to find a voice it's almost equally possible to find your own self your own voice or the voice of someone that you're missing you can sort of i think from that valve we just get back to it you can sort of wrap any mind around it at least temporarily um and so for me that's how grief can sometimes uh, play into the actual motivation to write Yeah, I love that. It's it's storming here, so I'm not sure if you can hear it or hear me. But um, but I love it. Um, I think that the only thing I can add is that you'll see, like in my name, I have we, um, and I started using this pronoun we, um, in the midst of, um, you know, in in one week's time, my mother lost her last brother and sister, um, about a decade ago. Um, um actually now twelve years ago. Um, no, 14 years ago, my goodness. Um, but I, I just, and, and it seems that from that point, there was something that was happening inside me because privately I was burying in Atlanta because at the time I, I lived with such shame about it. So many friends who were dying in the midst of an AIDS epidemic that was supposed to be, that was being narrated as ending, right? Because there was, you know, all this medication and antiretrovirals, but there were so many of my friends who were so racked with grief, with losing their uncles and aunts, or, you know, to the virus or to other illnesses, or because of their being outcast in their families. Um, and so for me, as I started to collect this, I don't know, what felt like a never ending, long bit of grieving, I, um, I decided that I would try to hold on to them through um, the spiritual traditions that I've learned from the Yoruba faith, something that I wasn't born into, that filled in gaps for me that the you know, Southern Missionary Baptist tradition could not. Um, and that led me to this the best way I could translate that, that idea that they are not gone, that they are ever present with me, um, was to sort of use that pronoun we, which after listening to Kava's poem, I thought, oh, is that, you know, is that transgressive in a way that's problematic or, or is it honoring them in the way that I want? It's something that I've really struggled, struggled with a great deal. But for me, that is, that is the only advice that I can give, which worked for me at a time when I felt like I wouldn't write poems again, because uh, I was in the midst of a PhD program trying to get out of that writing, you know, these scholarly essays and then trying to make a film about this horrific history of lynching in our country. And so um, trying to animate joy in these, these black folks' lives, these poor folks' lives, um, the joy that they, that my memories of them offered me um, 
is, is the only way that I found access to something like prayer and something like the divine um, that permitted me to never let go of them. I don't know if that answers at all your question. Yeah, thank you so much for those wonderful. Oh, I think I think you're you're still muted if you're if you're not done answering. Did you have a question, Sophia, that you wanted to ask everyone? Our yeah, last we, question. We, um, we got a, another question uh, in the chat about how you sense the passage of time um, as you read. And I wanted to extend that question to the passage of time and your the relationship that you have um, when you're writing poetry and uh, uh, to, 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 to the passage of, of time and also maybe the difference between um, how you imagine the, the rhythm of a, of a poem when you're writing it versus when you're reading it aloud, which I think is what the question was trying to get at originally. I think the, the effort for me has been to make the present pretense, the past, present, the future. Like I, I think because especially I'm always already thinking about black and brown people, indigenous people, queer people, people who are always seen as out of time, you know, um, already always disposable, fungible in our American society. I want um, them to be um, uh, um, indispensable, um, liminal, um, Yeah, I want them to, I want them to stand outside of whatever the limitations might have been on them in their lives and be hauntingly present, if only for the time that my voice um, brings them. I think, you know, it's so, so and beautifully that somebody brought up the interview with Max that, that Kave did because when I, when I would talk to my students about um, his work, and I meant what I said in the chat, like for the last three or four years, every spring I teach at the Mississippi University for Women and I teach a class on wellness and, and illness and, and Max is, is our entree into the semester often. And, um, and so it's just been, it's been to me like that, that interview to me makes, it's always available, right? His voice is always available. Like that, that's what I think poetry does. It suspends for the moment that we read the poems, all notions of goneness or loss and they are present, they are here as, as much as we, and you know, in African traditions, people only die when you start saying their names. So, you know, the fact that they're, the poem is there, the voice is there, um, keeps them liminal, keeps them forever here, present. And for those of us who didn't, you know, did not get to experience their presence as, as everyone here did, you know, someone who was here who did not know him personally, did not get to hear that voice, hold that hand, you know, be in, inside of his spirit. There's a way in which we will never know what you know of his brilliance and beauty and his kindness and love, but we get a glimpse of that when we enter that voice and that part of him that is his essence is with us and, and buoys me, a person who is lost, you know, countless people to HIV and AIDS and to this epidemic, and we feel less alone because he he is, you know. 
Absolutely. You know, as you were speaking, I was thinking how much he would, he would just love being part of this conversation because he felt so strongly about this um, in, in the way one reads a poem, even when he was alive and able to read his own poems. I think, you know, obviously he was aware of time in a very real sense in life too, but the performance of it, he was also a comedian. He loved comedy and timing and dramatic timing, but that didn't mean that for each poem, there was one way to time it or one place to pause. He would let the present moment or the present combination of feelings that he was having join with whatever led to that poem being written so that each time he read it, it was a different experience and you could never predict sort of the tone the, the poem wouldn't all have a certain timing that let you see it all as one sort of experience each. It was as if it was being thought. And I think that that timing, the timing of thought, we can't even really pinpoint it ourselves. Like, you know, dreams feel a certain way, but of course they're not, that's the most literal example, but even just thoughts, you know, we have feelings of our mind racing or our mind slowing down, but just, I think that in poetry and in performing a poem, you have a chance to merge the timing of speech and conversation and being with people and also the timing of thought. Um, I don't know, I, I definitely don't feel as strongly connected to that as a reader and performer. I think it's beautiful. I wanna, I wanna do that more, but I definitely feel it on the page in the space of a line break or an indentation I really feel you can not control a reader's experience, but you can share it. So even that you leave room for them to enter and then you can kind of be there too in, in some, some kind of liminal time maybe. Um, I think that's beautiful and so many poets work from, from Jean Valentine to Lucy to, to so many others, yeah. Yeah, I love, I love so much everything that's just been said. I just wanna sit at Lamar and Elizabeth's feet all day and listen to them talk about poems um yeah i i can't improve upon anything that's been said you know um elizabeth <clears throat> introduced jean valentine's voice to the conversation and she's one of my dear beloved poets who has passed recently um she is a poem you know when we're talking about time in poems she, um i'm so interested in stillness and ways to make stillness like the architectonic fundament the bedrock upon which the poem is built silence the 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 structure of the poem and language just the negative space poured around it and jean was like the the she was like the king of that you know i mean she was just like she was i i learned so much from her maybe more from her than it's like her and Dickinson, you know, about like how to use silence as that sort of architectural element and just have language being the mold poured around silence. But she, like, like she has a poem called I Came to You, and this is the poem in its entirety. Um, it's a short poem, but um, it goes, I came to you, Lord, because of the fucking reticence of the world. No, not reticence, not the world. Oh, Lord, come, Lord, come. We were sad on the ground. Lord, come. We were sad on the ground. And like the feeling that I have in my body right now, like the deeply embodied feeling is not because of the light. Paul Salon, yeah, 100%. He's the third of that trinity. Um, uh, but um, the feeling that I have in my body right now is not because of the language of that poem, it's because of the silence in that poem. You know what I'm saying? Like she says, I came to you, Lord. So you begin in this like liturgical register um, because of the fucking reticence. So you already get the sense of this exasperation because of the fucking reticence of the world. No, not reticence. Now there's like this rhetorical hesitancy. She, she's like correcting herself. No, not reticence, not the world. Oh. And then she just gives up. She's like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to do this. I'm not gonna be able to articulate this. Oh, Lord, come, Lord, come. We were sat on the ground, Lord, come. We were sat on the ground, right? She's just like, you know, like clearly the emotional catalytic here is like overwhelming the medium assigned to record it, right? Like clearly I've, I've, I was mistaken in thinking that I could render this in a poem, you know, like, oh, Lord, come, you know, like, and the, and, that's that is it there in the poem you know like her giving up on the poem is there in the you know and that's just like i mean you know that that i would i would trade every word i've ever written for like 
a hundredth of that feeling, you know, in something that I made, you know, I'm I, like, it's just like, that's, that's the juice for me, you know, it stills everything. Um, you know, when you think about like a painting, you know, like, like, you know, this, this painting of an old day thing that I have here, right? Like the entirety of this painting, you know, in the museum enters your eye at once, right? So like the, the temporality of this, like is instantaneous, right? Like you can certainly move your eyes around the painting, whatever, right? But like the, the, the temporal load out of this is instantaneous. When you think of like sculpture, you know, like this Gresham urn that I have here, um, you know, like you have to, you have to like animate your body to move around it. You like, you can, you can like perceive like a facet in an instant, right? But like, you have to, you have to call the body in to move around it to like perceive the entire text of this Gresham urn, right? And, or you can like move the Gresham urn, which is generally um, discouraged, like if you're looking at it in a museum or something, but like, um, but like time becomes like a part of the temporality of this object, right? And because time is a part of the temporal experience of the art object, then the body is as well, right? You have to move the body or you have to, your body is experiencing it durationally, right? If you're thinking about like music or something, that's like at the far end of the spectrum because like a single note doesn't tell you anything about like the duration or the shape of a symphony, right? Like a single, a single, a still frame from a movie doesn't tell you anything about the length of the movie or the content, right? Like, um, I guess maybe it tells you a little bit about the content. So I think about poetry, like situating poetry on the spectrum, right? Like if I hand you a poem by Basho, like a Basho haiku and the Bhagavad Gita, right? Like those sit very differently in the hand, right? Like they're obviously like temporally different experiences, right? But like the way that Lamar read that long sort of like, you know, Elizabeth called it a tour de force, right? But like, you know, like that long new poem, right? Like is is like that completely shapes the way that we experience its temporality, right? It's 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 something like a sculpture, right? And like Lamar reading it to us tells us like the speed at which we're moving around the urn, you know, like the speed at which we're like walking around the urn, right? Does this make sense, right? And so like, I feel like, I feel like poetry, you know, like there's like, like painting is at this end of the spectrum, like music is at this end, sculpture is somewhere in the middle. And then poetry is just kind of like doing this, like on the spectrum, you know, poetry is just sort of like, cartwheeling down the catwalk, you know, like back and forth, right? And 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 that trips me out so much, you know, thinking about like temporality and this. I, I'm, I'm just like, I'm getting myself excited now, but that's sort of what I'm thinking about. I can't help, I have to just jump in because I, I think that jumping around like is, is maybe true to language. And I keep thinking of Dickinson, who you brought in and like that in, in one of her most famous poems, just I finished knowing then after she drops down through worlds, like that body moving through things and that's that, you know, death, but just I finished knowing then, even our word then like wants to punctuate it, but dash, you know, then is also the thing that hinges us to the next thing. So I, I definitely feel like poetry wants to, even when it's at its most uh, pointing, it really wants to have us moving. And I love how all of you read your poems tonight. I, I just read a doc, uh, I watched a documentary about Richard Howard and he was talking about how he didn't like it at poetry readings when people said to him that it real seeing him perform his poems really made a difference to them and that it they came off the page. Um, but yet he talked about how important it was to learn how to perform and uh, his his poems and to read them well, um, so it it was really a special experience to to hear you all read tonight and to hear you talk about poetry and to hear you talk about the people you've loved and lost and especially during this pandemic when so many people have been have been lost. Um, poetry has been such a solace and a place where we can come together to, to talk about these things and to grapple with them. So thank you all for being here. Your, your three voices tonight, it was, it was such a trio. Um, we will always remember this reading and thank you for letting us record it. And I hope to see all of you next week when we hear Sean Singer and Roger Reeves and Adrian Mejica. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you all for being here with us tonight.